prior to the Olympics in 2002. So we went through a, a significant renovation then. Um, the only thing that's been renovated in the Family History Library since that time is the main floor discovery experience. And so you'll notice that uh, things look very differently, look and feel very differently on that floor and the other floors. Uh, we have a number of things that we need to address. Uh, here in the next few weeks, uh, one of the first things you'll see are prototypes of a new work surface uh, with workstations. Right now we have a single monitor experience, which is about a 2004 experience, I believe. And so we're going to try and uh, increase the effectiveness of that. The floors are all very dark. Uh, and so one of the things that I've noted is that with the ProScan readers, uh, the ProScan microfilm readers that we use in the copy center, if we were to use those at the workstations, we could turn all the lights on in the, on all of the floors. So we will, my goal is that all of the lights will come on. We will still have the dark cave experience for those who like the dark cave experience, <laughs> but we'll put it in a room off to the side and people can still take their film in there and be perfectly happy. So I'm not gonna try to just change everything that way. But that multiple screen experience then will give you the ability to look at a microfilm and see the, the digital image of that. You'll be able to download it. So we don't need the copy center because you can do it right there at your workstation. Uh, you'll have another monitor where you can look at your tree, another monitor where you can look at historical records or whatever. So you'll have at least three monitors and then you should have a place to hook up your uh, own laptop as well. So you'll have multi-screen multi workstations just like you do at home. Um, and we'll kind of try to bring this into a 2019 experience, right? So uh, that'll be the first thing you, that you'll see. Um, we scanned a number of books that we took out. Uh, we'll be bringing the books back into the library so you'll see quite a bit of uh, additional bookshelving and books going on the shelves uh, uh, as well. So we'll have both the digital image and we will have the book because when people are doing book research, my observation has been they've got like eight books in front of them and they're going back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes that's not as easy to do on monitors. While you can do it electronically, you can also do it quickly with the books. So we are a library and I intend to be a library. Cool. How, how wide is the remit of the library, David? Does it, does it, is it just the physical building? Or does it extend to the family history centers around the world? So, um, I'm also responsible for the experience in the family history centers. Okay. So we will be prototyping some of these concepts and some of these ideas. We'll start with the family history library. It will then extend to the regional libraries, where uh, we have about um, 16 regional libraries in our major centers, uh, Los Angeles, Mesa, St. George, you know, those areas, and then we will extend it to the family history centers throughout the throughout the uh, system. So that uh, the, one of the things I've noticed in the family history library is that with all of our assistants and all of our helpers, is that they're consuming one of the workstations, trying to help the person sitting next to them. And so every, it's like every other computer workstation is not being used uh, because it's because the chair is being taken. So as we change that configuration, I think it will improve the experience of the library. Since you were last director of the library some years ago, how have you noticed the change towards focus on youth or the youth using the library? Um, great question. Uh, when I was there before, we had very few youth who came into the library. And so there's been a dramatic shift. The Discovery Center uh, changed that overnight. Uh, at the time I was director before, uh, we would have youth groups that would come in. We had kind of a paper packet. We gave them some things to kind of chase through the library, but it was nothing like the experience we provide now. And so, um, I'm, two things are happening, particularly with the uh, professional community. We have been paying a lot more attention to the interns uh, coming out of the Brigham Young University program and BYU-Idaho and others. We've actually been taking them, uh, they've been sending them with uh, grant money that they have to major genealogical conferences. We've been introducing them to all of the leading genealogists in the country, building their network. Um, we have hired several of those interns uh, of late, and they're just, they're phenomenal. Uh, and, and so that, I think, uh, one of the bright spots is that whole thing has turned around. Uh, and so it's growing. But the youth that are coming in, we'll be doing more things as well. We're actually looking at some after-school experiences for youth and trying to create some things. We've got a lot of kids that are downtown. Uh, we've got some high schools nearby. Uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to create an environment 
where it's safe for them to come. The parents know where they're at. They know what they're doing. Um, and we'll have some after-school activities and, and try to focus on them. Uh, we'll also be doing, of course, evening and Saturday activities and continuing to build that. So uh, I'm envisioning some other events. Uh, we have some major communities in the Salt Lake Valley that we haven't been able to draw in. Uh, the Greek community, for example. Well, part of the challenge there is we don't have a lot of Greek records, so you know those are the kinds of mm -hmm. things that have to Patronymics have too. To happen. Mm -hmm. Right. To so, our youth so, so we're gonna so we're gonna prototype this and see how it works. The ideas that we've gathered, many of them actually have come from stakes that have already implemented them. And so, uh, one in particular up in Cardston, uh, in Alberta, uh, they have a very successful uh, after-school activity there. And we're gonna see if we're, we're gonna see if we can emulate it. If that's if, if that can be replicated, then obviously the information in that will be you know we'll send that out to, to people to do it. There are lots of us today wandering around with London bound t-shirts. Will the Family History Library have a presence in London? Uh, well, the Family History Library... Well, I, I know you, you have a physical so, so presence. Family will search, you be a Family Search will have its booth. Yeah. Um, uh, if I have my way, yes, there will be a number of, uh, certainly my British consultants that are there. Um, I don't know who's going to be on the program. Uh, so, uh, and as of yesterday, I didn't know whether I was going to London. <laughs> so, I still don't. Um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, no, there's no question we'll have some presence there. Uh, one of the other things that I have uh, worked with my staff is that, is that my staff will be doing much more uh, international travel on the ground, in the archives, learning about records, contributing that knowledge into the wiki. Um, they, you, you just, you learn so much when you are out and when you're there. It, it's just, you can't, you can't replicate that experience. And so mm -hmm. we've got to get them on the ground in the places. Absolutely. And they, they haven't traveled of late. I've used the Discovery <coughs> facility. Perhaps you'd like to talk about that a little bit. But just a thought, you know, you'll have to do quite a bit of work once you start moving that to Europe. Yeah, the Discovery experience right now is uh, does not have a full experience for all of our guests. Right. And so we are, we, um, we are working on what we call Homeland Experiences, where we have to build a lot of content. Yep. And we need to work with some significant partners to, to add the content for a number of different groups uh, so that regardless of where you are in the world, if you walk in and you have want to have a discovery experience, it's relevant to you, right? Yep. So right now I have guests from China that come to Temple Square, they walk into the Family History Library, and they're told what the price of gasoline was in the United States yeah. in 1931. And who are the NBA and champs? Yeah. yeah, and who the NBA <laughs> champs are, and who won the World Series, and they don't really care, right? right. Uh, totally get that. And so we've uh, started a major initiative to really pump a lot of content in there, but Excellent. you're spot on. Excellent. You had mentioned the uh, redesign of the experts on board yes. earlier. Just talk about that again. So, um, when I, when I walked into the library, uh, we had experts, uh, paid staff, from about 10 in the morning until 6 in the afternoon, uh, which they had basically said those are the core hours. Um, I'm, I'm a, if we're open, we're open. All services, all floors, everything's open uh, kind of guy. And so uh, uh, we're working through that, but we now have reference experts on the floor from 8 in the morning until 9 at night every day, uh, all the time that we're open. And so um, we're going to continue to build that. Um, you have to understand that we're dealing with about a third of the number of reference consultants that I had when I was there before. Oh, wow. Um, I won't be getting more FTE, wow. okay? So that's not going to happen. Um, those FTE were repurposed. Uh, that's how we have a massive engineering building in Lehigh that is able to build all of the products for, for the rest of the organization. I totally get that. I'm totally aligned with that uh, approach. We did it. Uh, but I have been given some latitude now to use all of the expert staff in the entire department, uh, not just the ones in the library. And so we're pulling uh, our content experts out. Uh, I mean, we have a number of people who've served in the library before, people like Darris Williams for Wales. Um, you know, Darris now can come over and serve a shift in the library. Um, Dave we met, French Canada, France, uh, you know, Suzanne. Ireland. Yeah, Suzanne, all of them with their expertise, they can come into the library and help us extend the, 
reference experience so that we can have coverage for those hours. Uh, the other thing that I can do, so for many years in the Family History Library, in, in the Family History Centers, we've been able to use people who are not members of the church as reference staff. But downtown, uh, we had to have, uh, we were not allowed to use people who were not members. Um, we have approval to do that now. So I will be able to use certified genealogists and others who live in the area and be able to use them uh, in the reference areas as well. I've spoken to many of them. Many of them are very interested in helping us out. And so I think we'll have a, a, a very credible experience in the library. I was gonna, I need to ask you a question. Um, there's over there the other day, and I was trying to find a book, and I was told that that book was out being digitized, and so I couldn't look at it. So what do I do? <laughs> yeah, um, the, the digital book thing is a, so I'm, I'm, both the, I'm both the guilty party and hopefully the solution here. Hmm. Um, back when I was in the library before, I looked at each of the segments of the data that we had and said, so how are we going to take, how are we going to make our books available to everyone, right? We've got, I'm sitting here with 600,000 books, what do I do with them, right? Because you either, to look at the book, you have to come to Salt Lake. And so we began working at that time with Brigham Young University, we piggybacked on their uh, new uh, digital book scanning program at that point. Well, ours grew, we finally got to the point where they kicked us off their servers and said, hey, you guys have got to go do your own thing. And so that's continued to grow. Uh, we've had different rulings at different times from our attorneys uh, as to whether or not we could look at look at a digital book um, and view it online. So right now in the industry, um, uh, iArchives, for example, uh, is begging for somebody to sue them. <laughs> uh, just nobody will. The publishers won't do it because they don't want the precedent set because they iArchives is confident that they will win this court case if, it, if they could ever get it to court. And, and the case is that when I walk into a library and I pull a book off the shelf, and, I'm, and it's a single usage, if I can control that same usage online, then it's the same as if I'd walked into a library. Yep. And so we originally started out that way, um, but being risk adverse, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're hoping somebody else uh, takes that case to court uh, other than us but so that's going to play out in the courts and it'll happen but in the meantime we've uh, for preservation we've digitized a number of our books we have uh, scanned a lot of books uh, we've scanned a lot that are out of copyright that we hope to be able to put on um, we also will be bringing the books back into the library so part of the challenge was we had to go at a very accelerated rate to make room for the discovery experience on the main floor and so we took out all of those published family histories. Many of those books were uh, digitized using a flat sheet scanner. So the spine had to be cut off the book and they were fed through a thing. And so uh, the cost to rebind those books uh, is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be cheaper in some instances for me to repurchase the book or to get donated copies of the book. Uh, so we still want those, we'll still get those back. Like I say, I've got a number of different ways, particularly as I integrate the, the flat workstations with computer stations and the, and the film readers, I can gain a lot of space in the library and it will give me enough footprint to be able to put the books back on the shelves. So you'll see some changes. So, so you know, we need the book and they say it's cut off, we can't see it, we just There's gotta not, wait, yeah, yeah, just yeah. gotta wait, hope they hurry up and get it done. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the book's actually out in the in the west uh, yes. part of the valley yes. and uh, in a stack somewhere. Stack I mean, somewhere. yeah, I mean, if we if we stopped every time to pull a book, um, the, we just wouldn't be able to do it. So, tell ourselves and our clients to be patient. Yeah, I'm sorry about that <laughs> it's one. It's okay. I mean, it is one. It's like a squad. Somebody said, no, 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 that's where these books yeah, are. Um, I was going crazy trying to find them. I, I, I haven't um, found sufficient space yet, but I've actually looked at the possibility of bringing the book scanning operation back into the library so that then the book is just in the other room and I could retrieve it, but we'll have to see what happens. What keeps you awake at night? I'm sorry. What keeps you awake at night? What's your biggest worry? What keeps worry? me awake at night? I ask a lot of people that too. Yeah. Uh, you know what keeps me awake at night is uh, guests having a really quality experience when they come into the library. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to not have a good experience. I want to exceed their expectations when they come to the library. And so when I hear anecdotally of people going away and saying, I will never come back to that library again, it just pains me, right? Um, if, if people are leaving in tears and it's not tears of joy, those are the kinds of things that keep me awake at night because I want them to all have a good experience. Uh, 
I want us to be able to help them. I want us to be able to, to get them the assistance that they need. And so um, all of these others, the, the logistics stuff, I mean, we can do library stuff all day long. I mean, that for me, that's the easy part, right? Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the guest experience and the personal interaction and the, and the communication and just everybody feeling like when they come in, the experience is all about them yeah. because that's what I want it to be. It's all about you. It's not about us. It's not about how big we are, how much we have, how, what we're doing. It's none of that. It's about you. And how can I make that experience personal to you uh, is what keeps me awake at night. It actually happened to my wife. Okay, starts knocking She won't out. come back. I can't get her back. And see, that just that, that, that just pains me, right? So, because I uh, hopefully someday you'll you'll convince her to give us another yeah. chance. It happens. I know. I know. Exactly. I know. Even the best of worlds it happens. I know. Well, I mean, think about it. We all have uh, uh, we've all had an experience with a company that we've said we'll never go back. So you know, I don't care. Pick pick your favorite target, right? Whether it's an oil change company or a restaurant or a tire company, you know, whatever it is, it's like they will never get my business again. Mm -hmm. And it may have happened when I was 20, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, for 45 years, they have not had my business. And that's just, you know, we get strong emotional attachments like that. Well, and, and hopefully that's the bulk of the experience. We have a, we have a mm -hmm. very high uh, success rate. I mean, all of our of our metrics, everything, it's its very high, but to me it's never high enough, right, until everybody has a good experience. Do you get any time to do your own family history research? Do I get any time to do my own and family history research? And what's the most research? interesting thing you found about one of your ancestors? Okay, well, uh, boy, I should have paid you to ask that question. <laughs> so, uh, many people know that I've done Irish research for years and years and years. Um, credited, certified in Irish research. There are a number of people who believe that Irish research is kind of like the toughest research on the planet, um, and I've, it's not, okay? But, uh, so recently, uh, uh, I have been paying attention to some African Americans who have rancher DNA. Wow. And in his will in 1812, John Grant Rancher says, and should the two freeborn mulattoes now living with me remain faithful to their wife until they arrive at the age of 21, they're to receive $25, a set of homespun clothes, a hilling hoe, a maddox, and several other implements. Um, I, within the last year, was contacted by one of the descendants of those. And so I have been trying to do pre-1870 slave research, and it is the toughest research oh, I've yeah. ever done. Yeah. Okay? It is just kicking me up one side and down the other. But we're having a lot of fun. I am like this close. I, am, I literally, um, I have a, a, a record of basically their marriage in 1813, which is the year wow. after the 12th, after 1812. And I firmly believe that uh, James Rencher is one of the two freeborn mulattoes. Wow. But I, we now, with uh, the DNA test, we, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of um, African Americans with Rencher DNA, and now I've got to sort them between which of the two freeborn mulatto groups they belong to. Oh, isn't that cool? So, and when do I have time? Um, sleep is so overrated. That's yeah. all I can tell you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. It was thank great. Thank you. It's been good to be with you. Great.